everyone, and again, welcome to everyone participating virtually. Uh, our one camera has died on us temporarily, but fortunately for this session, that we, um, it should be just okay. <laughs> So the, the purpose of this session is really quickly to take stock of what we have got uh, in terms of moving uh, in terms of moving forward. Uh, because in the next session we're actually going to break out and actually take decisions and recommendations for decisions around the inaugural credential from HR partners. And part of the culture of the, the OER movement is in remix. In other words, what already exists out there that we can you know, remix for the purposes of our, um, of our initiative. We will also be taking a, a remote teleconference call from Vancouver, Canada, uh, where BC Campus will be reporting back on the recommendations from the online scope seminar, where a number of folk from all around the world have provided us <coughs> with recommendations. Uh, uh, for the inaugural credential of an education resource university. And how this works is anchor partners have decision-making autonomy. So we, we're going to table what the community has put forward uh, in terms of our decision-making as we, as, as we move forward. I mean, you'll be very familiar with the graphic of the OER University, the notion that it, isn't, it is plausible to provide free learning opportunities using courses based solely on OER. But what our communications don't necessarily uh, communicate, which is actually hard to communicate, is some of the dynamic and the history that has taken place in terms, in terms of getting to where we were at. And so the story goes, um, in November uh, last year, Massey University hosted an Australasian Council for Open and Distance Learning event themed around open education resources. And as things happened, both myself and Jim Taylor were at the ACO meeting. And uh, you know, Jim's presentation was really around open scholarship, right, Jim, if I remember correctly. And I was sitting there looking and saying, hey, that's exactly what we are trying to do. And these ideas Jim had already formulated you know, back in you know, 2007. And so I, mean, I said, I, I need to be speaking with Jim. And we, we got together and said, you know, hey, you know, what are the next steps? We need to take this forward. And um, what the next steps, in fact, were was to build a, a high-level framework or a logic model which we could use as a foundation for planning this future. And so what we, we did is we convened an open planning meeting on the 23rd of February here at, at the Tower Polytechnic to actually propose this framework and you know, to actually test it, ask the questions, you know, is this a model that can work and facilitate our planning around what it is we are trying to do. And at that stage, we had three anchor partners. At the OER Foundation, the University of Southern Queensland, and uh, Otago Polytechnic, of course. With strong support from TechRe, Rory's uh, unit at Athabasca University in helping to conceptualize this planning through the UNESCO call over <coughs> so, so that's where we were at. And um, the first meeting we convened, it was an open planning meeting. We took a huge risk in you know, streaming an open plan, how do we plan open meetings? Um, and with funding support from UNESCO, we were able, we were able to you know, stream this meeting. And all that, we had well over 300 people engaged in providing feedback uh, you know, to the model. And we set ourselves a number of targets at, at that meeting uh, around the, the logic model. Um, and in the closing session, we, we documented uh, as a group, and I should also reflect, the 23rd of February was the day of the Christchurch earthquake. And so we had a rather empty room uh, here because many of our flights on the South Island are actually re you know, rooted through Christchurch. And, and I know a number of people sitting here today couldn't make the meeting because of the flight delays from the earthquake the day before. But nonetheless, we proceeded and uh, were, you know, were able to move forward. And in the closing session, we, we said to ourselves, well, one of the things we've got to do is uh, recruit a critical mass of anchor partners, of founding anchor partners, who could move this planning forward. Because if you are planning a collaborative network, it's the partners who have to take the decisions, right? 
not the OER Foundation. But in order to do that, you need a critical mass of institutions to get to the point that you can actually take decisions to move forward. And as you well know, um, Jim and I and, and Rory and uh, Robin, we speculated about you know, what would the number be. And we set a very ambitious target of 10 institutions. Um, and hence the uh, OER tertiary education network, and if you look at the acronym, it's 10, right? Uh, we've achieved the Baker's dozen, and, and that's healthy, so we've achieved our first target in, uh, in terms of moving forward. We also at the meeting said that we need to agree the inaugural credential. And one of the vehicles we were going to use to help prepare for that decision, which we'll actually be taking today among our anchor partners, was to collaborate with the help of our other founding anchor partner, BC Campus, uh, in, in, in Canada. And they hosted an open online seminar um, discussing uh, you know, what the inaugural credentials should be. And this is an open community, right? It's anybody, even folk who aren't anchor partners, who are helping to inform um, these decisions. And we have some recommendations on the table that have come from this group, which we will consider today. And that's why we'll be uh, linking up with Paul Stacey, who has provided an excellent summary of these recommendations. We also recognize that in order to do this, I mean, we, it, it's really a learning by doing process. And we're going to have to identify a prototype or prototypes uh, to help inform the development of the model. And at this meeting, we will also be taking decisions uh, around the prototype for the OER University for the big launch uh, at the, the date in the future, which we will decide on um, today. <coughs> One of the other requirements we set ourselves was, uh, you know, the, the group said to me, okay, wait, well, go out and find some money to help us. And, and that's what we did. Uh, we went ahead and uh, tried to secure some funding support to move this forward. And we are very, very grateful to the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, who have been major funders in the open education resource arena, who has provided a, a, a level of funding support. It's 100,000 US dollars. Uh, over two years to help get this planning and the OER University operation. We, of course, um, UNESCO has been instrumental uh, in, in funding a number of very significant components of this, the streaming of vote events. Um, this is the only way we would be able to engage uh, the, large, uh, the larger community and, and, and thank you very much to UNESCO. I appreciate if you would convey our thanks to, to, to uh, your director. Um, what UNESCO also funded, which is very, very important, is the development of an online course on open licensing. So we have a full online course on the complexities of copyright and licensing in an education environment, uh, which was funded by UNESCO, but also released as open education resources. So UNESCO is, of course, leading by example, by funding an initiative which is openly released. So why is that important? It means we will have the capacity to build skills and knowledge around open licensing for all our partner members. We've run the pilot of the workshop. We had 350 uh, people from, I think it was 47 different countries participating. So it's one of the things we can actually build on and reuse for building capacity in our own institutions by running that workshop to help people get their heads around how all this nightmare of copyright actually works. So that was pretty useful. Uh, it helps if I use the right machine, right? <laughs> and so some of the, the, the initial thoughts around you know, the requirements for a, a first credential uh, is that ideally it should be a qualification that is already on our books. Why? We don't want to go and have to uh, get new uh, approvals uh, for qualifications. I mean, we want this to happen quickly. Um, in order to achieve credible credentials with the appropriate quality, we have to make sure that our founding anchor partners and any anchor partners in the future are in fact accredited institutions within their national jurisdictions. Um, and, and this is the model that we are working with. Um, in countries, because different countries use different uh, structures and methods for assuring quality, uh, and the, the, you know, how the credentialing system works. But for countries that actually use national qualifications frameworks, like New Zealand, um, 
like South Africa, for example, that the credential must be mapped to an existing credential within the national qualifications framework. We also want to make sure that it was sufficiently flexible so that it would be easy for institutions to take decisions around which uh, course, courses they could contribute to the network. And remember, these aren't full course developments in the traditional sense. These are courses which we will assemble and reuse existing OER. As you well know, we have achieved uh, our, our critical mass of institutions to move this forward. And it's now getting to the point that we actually can't, I, I, mean, I can't fit all the locos and all the partners on the same slide. And I reckon that's a good position to be in. So I do apologize for the logos which don't appear on that slide. I'm going to have to figure out a new method of you know, conveying this information. But um, you know, if you go back to the history of education, undoubtedly the most significant and radical transformation since uh, medieval times has been the inception single mode distance uh, teaching. Um, it, it was the most significant revolution since the industrial revolution in education <coughs> because it broke the insidious link between the time and place in learning. Collectively, we as partners are co-planning the next most significant revolution we are going to see in the provision of higher education. And that is through the mainstreaming of open education resources and practices as an integral component of our, you know, of our models. Um, so, and, and it's very, very interesting to see that many of the founding anchor partners were in fact the original pioneers that developed PLA, that developed open distance learning. Um, so there's this interesting question of whether there is an innovation DNA. And you know, I sense that there's this innovation DNA around the table uh, in terms of moving forward. So very briefly, I mean, around the world there are a number of, and I just want to quickly refer to the work that's been done in Europe because we can actually reuse uh, quite a number of these resources. There are projects which are developed around the quality practices for OER. We can reuse those re resources. There's another um, very significant project which I want to look at now. And this is the OER test initiative. It's an initiative which is funded by the European Commission, which basically is aiming to investigate how we get these models to work. And at this point, it's very important to answer the uh, telephone call. So I'm going to show you which button you press here. Yeah, yeah, that one Hello. Good day, Paul. Hello. Hi, Paul, can you hear me? It's right here. Oh, we are mute. Paul, can you hear me? Because yes, I can hear you. Oh, all good. Canada. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we're very pleased to have Canada join us. And Paul, again, thank you for all your time and effort in uh, a, uh, you know, preparing the work around the scope seminars for recommendations uh, for the inaugural credential, but also taking the time out to prepare the inputs for this meeting, so we are very, very appreciative. So without further ado, Paul, I'm, I'm going to hand over to you, um, you know, to summarize the recommendations that have come from the open community uh, around the inaugural credential that OER anchor partners should consider in their decision making. Thanks, Wayne, and maybe I'll just uh, start by congratulating all of the anchor partners around the table. I've been watching on the web stream, and. Uh, Pretty impressive bunch around the table then. I think that bodes well for the future of the OERU and I wish you all great success in the next couple of days. Um, I, I, I'm assuming Wayne you distributed this or have it up on the screen, but um, for uh, as an input into today's deliberations and, and those over the next couple of days, uh, Wayne asked me to put together a summary of what took place over a two and a half week period at the end of August through September where we had an online discussion around what might make for a suitable OERU credential. And so I tried to distill out of uh, all that extensive discussion, which was very rich, the key elements that might suit the OERU as a starting point. Uh, so let me just walk through the, uh, the, the 
potential credentials that could be the inaugural OERU credential. I'd say the one that received the greatest attention was a Bachelor of General Studies, which you see up in the top left, which would mix together social sciences, natural sciences, humanities, a kind of liberal education focus with an emphasis on employability skills. Um, a lot of discussion around this degree identified it as a simple, easy to start degree that is on the books at most of your institutions. But there is a lot of recommendations that it provides some tracks or specialization. For example, a technology track or an education track or a community and economic development track, etc. So that it has some flexibility in it. There's uh, some suggestions around how many credits might be involved and also some very interesting discussion and extensive discussion, I would say, on the ability to use prior learning assessments for people to establish some initial basis of credit that they may already qualify for and then pursue the remaining credit through OER. There are even some discussions around how the OER component might be done and I, I know from your earlier talks this morning there's a lot of talk about self-study but there are some other models where there's some suggestions for cohorts to be involved and even potentially local facilitators to be involved, with the result being the student having the ability to take a challenge exam or present some sort of portfolio to receive the credit that would go towards this degree. Um, in the Bachelor of General Studies concept, there were also suggestions that the credentials take advantage of the ability to ladder. So, could you ladder certificates and diplomas together, leading eventually to a full bachelor's degree? So I'd say that's uh, perhaps the number one um, potential inaugural credential. But the Diploma of Arts from the University of Southern Queensland was also put forward as a potential starting point. This is a first year of study, the freshman year of a Bachelor of Arts degree. Again, a kind of arts focus. Um, the emphasis of this diploma is around credit transfer to other programs and transdisciplinary foundation year. Again, with this uh, discussion on this degree, there was talk about specialization streams, similar to what was discussed in the Bachelor of General Studies. And I think that this is another good potential model for, for you to consider. The other three, as you can see in this diagram, um, an associate of science was identified as a possible credential um, when you survey the OER that are currently available out internationally, there's a lot of existing OER available in the science field. So if you wanted to draw on and make use of existing open educational resources, it would be a rich, a rich field to draw on and provide you with a lot of foundation material to build out an associate level credential. Um, but there was quite a discussion around education and nursing as also being suitable for an inaugural credential. A Bachelor of Education was seen as having a big need, especially in developing countries, where there's a lot of uh, existing teachers and nurses who may not have the full qualifications that a Bachelor of Education or a Bachelor of Nursing would provide. And there's also this aspect of that being a relatively non-competitive space where it's a helping profession that is uh, something that is in big need. I, I guess uh, there were some folks who felt that a, even a master's level credential in the education space could be something of interest, particularly around open educational resources itself. So, the ability to create OER, to use OER, to reuse them, to assess them, all the pedagogies around it is itself a rich field of education and uh, certainly Rory talked about it at the Basque University, one of the courses that they're developing as part of their master's degree that could be a starting point, but there is an interest uh, certainly among the discussion seminar participants in seeing a full credential around OER be developed. And I think that's uh, a possible in our OERU credential. So those would be the, the um, 
I've got a high level, very quick summary of uh, the credentials that were discussed in the seminar. At the very bottom, you'll see a list of uh, criteria that were also put forward for you all to consider in terms of making a decision. So uh, there were there were comments that uh, the best decision around an inaugural credential would be for it to be politically safe but scalable. Uh, have you know no major resistance against it and be operational within a reasonable time frame of say a year. Um, there's obviously an interest in ensuring that whatever the inaugural credential is, that it provides some some benefit to all of the member partner institutions in the OERU. It's clearly I think there's a need for all of you to be involved and to collaborate on the the uh, either development of new OER or reuse of existing OER in terms of putting together the courses that would form this inaugural credential. And lastly, I know Wayne, this is something that you like to emphasize, is that the qualification, if at all possible, should be on the books of maker partners and ideally registered with the country's national qualifications framework as a means of ensuring high level of quality. So that's a high summary, Wayne, and I hope that's helpful for everyone around the table. Well, I, that, that is extremely helpful because these are the inputs we're going to use at the next session um, for taking the, the decision around uh, recommendations for the inaugural credential. So, so again, Paul, uh, thank you, very, you know, so much for your time and input uh, into uh, getting this right. And, and I think part of the success of the BC campus model with OER development has been this conscious, conscious effort to map your OER funded development to existing credentials. And you know, I think it's one of the reasons why the BC campus model has been so, uh, so, so successful. Uh, so Paul, in the interest of time, we're running a, a tight schedule. I just want to, on behalf of everybody here, say thank you uh, for the efforts and, of course, to all the contributors internationally uh, that have come forward with these recommendations. So thank, thank you very much, Paul. Thanks, Wayne, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to, to be involved, and uh, good luck with the next couple of days. We'll, see, well. we'll see you online, Paul. Thanks. So basically, just to wrap up in terms of what we've got, we've got this European project funded by the European Commission that's actually looking into how this might work in a real sort of cross-border scenario. And they're going to be developing a whole number of process descriptors, which will be openly licensed, which we can, of course, reuse and adapt within our models. Uh, you know, and again, I think this is something we should be looking at closely. The group will also be looking for institutions who might want to trial some of these process protocols. So we need to know that that is happening on the landscape uh, internationally. The other one, of course, and this is why we are so grateful that the Commonwealth of Learning is, is with us, is the transnational qualifications framework for, small, uh, for, for the virtual university for small states of the Commonwealth. They have already been grappling with how do you develop an, an, an international qualifications framework um, that can facilitate cross-credit recognition uh, within a global system. So we already have a good starting point. And again, that resource is openly licensed, so we can consult these resources and reuse whatever is useful for us collectively as a partnership. So um, that's what we've, we've got. I mean, as, as, as we know, uh, we really think we have a low-cost, low-risk, but high-impact innovation model. And at this point, um, you know when a project is reaching a level of maturity is when the conservative higher education sector starts researching what you're doing. And um, I, you know, I'd like to ask Rory just to come fill us in on a Canadian-funded research project which relates to what we're doing. I wouldn't describe us as a conservative <laughs> yeah, we're uh, uh, Wayne and I are working with a uh, um, an RPL um, expert, Diane Conrad, uh, on uh, uh, looking at politi policies on RPL around the world and in challenge exams um, uh, to get a, a grasp on what some good ideas are for 
uh, uh, scaling, making them more scalable and more cost effective. <coughs> and uh, um, we're being funded by the uh, SHIRT, which is the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of uh, Canada, and a special uh, insight fund. So uh, what we want to come out of that is, uh, is a report um, um, that will give us some good ideas of what we're all doing and others are doing, and uh, uh, maybe we can get some idea of the best practices so as, uh, we can move towards more scalable systems. Thank you very Thank you much, Rory. Okay, so we've reached the point in the meeting now where we can actually move forward to start making some implementation decisions, or at least recommendations for implementation decisions, because we officially need to go back to our institutions and these kinds of things. But I think we need to firm up some you know, firm decisions around what the next steps are, one of which is recommendations for the inaugural credential. And you can see the rationale. Uh, in terms of the inputs we have, we have some recommendations from the open community which we can use as a starting point. Uh, and we're now moving to small group discussions. And we're going to uh, constitute three groups. Two groups that are going to be looking at the recommendations uh, for the OERU uh, credential and what your institution might be able to contribute uh, to, uh, to the network. So we'll have two groups uh, focusing on that, and you will record, and I'll, 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 there's a place in the wiki, and I'll explain where that is, where you, you can actually get a link to record your uh, decisions and recommendations. The third group will be looking at quality assurance and cross-border articulation issues. And, and this is a, 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 an important agenda item for UNESCO, uh, in terms of how do we improve quality across the world through the use of open education resources. So what I want to ask, if you have a real passion around the, you know, the design, development of quality assurance mechanisms, um, you, should, you should be in that group. Now, the international governmental agencies have no choice around the group they may join. The international governmental agencies need to be joining the quality assurance and the cross-border articulation group because there are no agencies better positioned to be able to advise on how this might work on an international level. So with, with humble apology, <laughs> the international IGOs don't get a choice in this matter. Um, so we, we can move forward. So what I need to know is, is there anybody else who would like to be on the quality assurance group? And the reason I'm doing this is so I can extract you from dividing you up for the other two groups, if that makes sense. Okay, so we've got, great. Thank you very much. Three, great. Four. Okay, great. What I need the people that are joining the QA group is not to stand up when I tell you to stand up. Okay. And because we are collaborating across universities and community colleges, I'm going to ask, with apology, all the universities to stand up so I can number you. <laughs> so all the universities representatives to stand up. Now, and then I'm just going to give you a number, and then you must remember it. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. Okay, apology for pointing, but I want to get this done quickly. Number one, three, one. Okay, you're a one boy. We're going to accept you. I know I'm one. <laughs> And for the same thing, I ask the community colleges, institutes of technology and polytechnics just to stand up. And I think it was just. You didn't stand up, so stand up. Okay. Uh, one, two. One, two. One, two. One. Okay, so there you go. If you're one, you're in group one. Provide your recommendations for the inaugural credential. If you're number two, you're group two. The quality assurance folk will be meeting together. Now we're going to decide how we're going to split this up. QA is a relatively small group, so we could maybe use your office if that's okay, Robin. So the quality assurance people, we will migrate to Robin's office. For what group are you in? Two. My office will come. So group two will uh, accommodate uh, group two discussing the recommendation for the inaugural credential. And group three will be here. Um, I also, before we all run through, two things we need to do. 
One, I need to uh, a formal welcome. Um, I'd just like to introduce David Paul, who's the director of the USQ Open Access College, and he would have been here this morning, except he's just flown in from Japan overnight. <laughs> Sorry, I'm late, everybody. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, David, and we're very pleased to have you for your commitment after a long flight you know, to come step into a meeting like this. And thank, thank, you, thank you very, very much. Now, the second thing you need, to, uh, and I'm going to be circulating between the groups to make sure that you are progressing and have got the right spots on the, um, the website. Go to the Wiki Educator website. It's wikieducator.org. If you just Google it, you'll find it. And right at the top, I haven't got it on screen at the moment, uh, unfortunately. But at the very top of the Wiki Educator website, you will see a link to the OER University Planning Meeting. Click on that link, it will take you to the agenda page. And on the agenda page, there are embedded links for a Google document which discusses the decisions uh, you need to report on. So you just click on that. And please, if somebody in the group with a computer and a connection can record, you will be reporting back on your recommendations, which we will record for the purposes of, of this meeting. Does that make sense? Yeah. All good. Thank you very much. <coughs> All right. So, and we'll reconvene here at um, what is the correct time? Two thirty. Two thirty. We reconvene back here. Uh, for 2.30. For our virtual online participants, if you go to the virtual participant column, with thanks and again acknowledgement to BC Campus, they have set up an etherpad environment where we have collaborative documents for virtual participants to uh, propose their recommendations uh, as well, which we will be taking um, at the meeting depending on uh, the contributions that come in. So thank you very much. One, 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 one,